So today we're going to talk about something that for some of you will be right on time. Um, you'll learn a lot, but for others of you, it might be hard to hear. Today we're talking about the relationship between pain and growth. We've been in a series for the last number of weeks, um, what it means to walk with God through difficult situations, what it looks like to walk with God when it hurts, when life hurts. And one scripture that I've been looking forward to a lot in this series is the one we're going to get into today. One that talks about this real relationship between the growth that we aspire to. For many of you who have been coming to church for a little while, or maybe you've only been coming for the last number of weeks, we have a version of who we want to be. We want to grow. We want to have a real relationship with God. And scripture presents to us that one of the ways that God does that is through pain, it's through difficulty, it's through hardships. Uh, my wife and I, um, we have a goal to go to every national park in America, and uh, we've been to a number so far, and they are breathtaking. It's one of the best things that our government has ever done is to preserve these wonderful national parks. And years ago, we went to Sequoia National Park, and we got a chance to see these giant sequoias, and they were absolutely breathtaking it really felt like you were walking among giants. And we would stop and we would read the signs on the side of the trees, and one of the things that I learned that was so fascinating about sequoias was how much fire plays a role in them becoming giants. Sequoias rely on fire to release their seeds. That if you were to walk around Sequoia National Park right now, there are all of these seeds all over the ground, and these seeds do not get released until there is a fire that goes through and burns. And the, the fire releases the seed from the acorn and allows it to go into the ground. Now, it's not just in releasing the seeds. The sequoia tree, in order for it to become a giant, it needs that fire to happen, not just once, but routinely, to burn away other plants in the area that would be competing with this sequoia for moisture and for nutrients and for sunlight. And not just other trees, but this fire doesn't, also needs to burn away its own branches and things on the bottom of the sequoia tree. And unless there is fire in and around the sequoia tree, it would never become a giant. In other words, sequoias cannot grow to become giants unless there's a lot of fire going on in and around them. Now, this got me thinking. There are a number of places in the, in the Bible where it talks about the fires of hardships, the fires of difficulties, and instead of these fires destroying you, Scripture says that just like the Sequoia National Park, where you have these giants, these things that are wonderful to marvel at, these things that are gorgeous to behold, Scripture tells us that the way that Every man and woman who has become a giant in faith has become what they are are because of the fires in and around them. It has been the fires that have released them. It has been the fires that have burned away other competing things that have allowed them to become giants. People can't really grow to be giants in the faith unless there's a lot of fire in and around them. And so I want to read 1 Peter 1. It's a portion of Scripture that I think is going to be really helpful for us as we look at this concept and the relationship between pain and growth. 1 Peter 1, 3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Here's why these various trials come. So that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, 
Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So what is Peter saying in the scripture? Uh, A number of things. First and foremost, it's really important to understand the context in which Peter is writing this letter. So this is called an epistle. This is a letter written to a real group of people who are going through a real situation. So this group of people that Peter writes this letter to, he's not just trying to write them theology that's divorced from their lives. They're going through some hard times. And Peter uses this concept of fire because they're actually going through fires. There is this tyrant, this emperor named Nero, that was persecuting Christians, and he was killing them in droves. Some of these people, just because they were Christians, were being burned alive or fed to lions just for believing in Jesus. And Peter says to them something that almost sounds offensive. He says, you are being guarded by by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, if I were the first recipient of this letter, I would say, Peter, boss, what are we talking about? How am I being guarded when my life is quite literally on fire around me? And here's what Peter is trying to instill into this crowd that although they are going through a nightmare, although this might be something in your life right now where that feels laughable for God to be guarding you, Scripture is not just talking about God guarding you from every bad thing that could happen to happen. Certainly, bad things and difficult, difficulties happen in our life. What Peter is assuring his crowd, what he's trying to tell us is this. You and I are being guarded from our pain being meaningless, and from us being alone. Now, there is a greater tragedy than the pain that we go through. There's a much greater tragedy than any pain that we can endure. It would be the tragedy of being alone or your pain being meaningless. And Peter is saying, none of your pain is meaningless. This is happening so that the tested genuineness of your faith, so that your faith, which is more precious than gold, would be refined that God, who was the master goldsmith, would use this pain and grow you from it. Verse 7, Peter says, So that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though it is perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter's letting his crowd know that fire destroy things, yes, but in the right conditions, with the right goldsmith, Fire does not destroy, it refines, it purifies. Here's where we're going today in our big idea. The trials that we experience now are not meaningless. They serve to refine and to purify your faith. Let me read that again. The trials you experience now, they are not meaningless. They serve to refine and to purify your faith. Now, a couple of quick caveats about this. Uh, First and foremost, knowing this is not meant to negate the pain. One of my favorite scriptures in John 11 is Jesus, where Jesus resurrects a man named Lazarus. Jesus is friends with these two sisters, Mary and Martha. He gets word that their brother is ill. Jesus waits, and he gets word later that Lazarus has died. Jesus and his whole crew join in a caravan to go towards Mary and Martha. And scripture says that when Jesus sees Mary and Martha and he sees the grief that they are currently experiencing, scripture says that Jesus wept. Jesus knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knew that in 15 minutes, everybody was going to be celebrating. And yet, Jesus did not over-spiritualize the moment. Jesus grieved. Jesus wept. And so this is not meant to make you put a spiritual band-aid on top of real pain. First and foremost, the first thing we can do to be most faithful to God is to feel the pain, is to grieve our losses, is to rely on other people, is to allow the weight of the moment to meet us exactly where we are. So number one, this is not um, meant to just slap theology on top of pain. We can do both at the same time. Number two, I really do want to say very clearly that God does not need anything to grow you. Scripture says that God is sovereign. Genesis 1, you see 
the account of the earth being formless and void and empty, and God created everything out of nothing. God does not need evil and suffering. And one of the great mysteries in life is in, well, why does it exist? And I don't know the answers to all of these things. But I also don't want us leaving here thinking that, well, God needed this specific thing to happen, this tragedy, this sin that's happened to you, or whatever the dysfunction. And God does not need any of these things. However, the mystery that we are walking through today is that sometimes, although God doesn't need anything, God uses the pain and suffering in our life to refine us. But first and foremost, we want you to be grounded in something that has stood the test of generations. Now, one of the things we talked about in the series is that all of us will go through periods of life where we suffer, where we go through difficulties. And uh, this past week has been, uh, admittedly, a very difficult week for my family. Uh, one day I'll tell the story in full. But for today's purposes, know that I am wrestling with the scripture as a recipient of it, uh, and I'm taking it by faith as I'm inviting you to do the same. But there is so much safety in accepting the wisdom of scripture passed down from generation to generation. A couple of weeks ago, uh, my son and I, the breakdancing son who did the handstand on stage. Yes, very proud, very proud moment. We had a um, father-son trip, and uh, we flew to Illinois, and we got this cheap rental car, and I got the cheapest rental car I could get, not knowing that it was going to snow the next day. And so I'm driving around in this little putt-putt uh, in, in the snow, and I'm kicking myself that I didn't upgrade for the SUV. And um, I realized that the vehicle that I was traveling in was insufficient to plow new terrain ahead of me. And so the best thing I could do is to drive in a path that had already been driven in front of me. I could see tire marks in the road ahead of me, and I wasn't going to take a shortcut or try to go a way that had not been traveled. And in inclement weather, in the storms of life, the best thing you can do is to drive the path that has already been driven ahead of you. And what Scripture is telling us, all throughout the, the, the canon of Scripture, you see that for thousands of years, men and women have relied not on understanding everything completely, not on figuring out what God was doing and why God was doing it, but rather they have trusted that in their pain and in their misery, God was doing something. God was working. And Peter is inviting us to get in the car. And Peter is saying, when you find yourself in the storms of life, I want you to drive in the path that has already been driven. You'll see that there's no crashes ahead of you. But there's so much safety in that. And so suffering, as Peter would tell us, is one of God's tools to sharpen and to grow us from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity. Suffering is one of God's tools in his tool belt that he uses. So a couple of implications for us from 1 Peter 1. And uh, first and foremost, I was thinking about this this week. No one loves a test, but we all love tested things. Has anybody flown in the last year? I love getting the seats that are kind of like near the wings. I'm always looking at the wing. I'm looking at the bolts on the wing. I'm like, is that bolt shaking? Is that... I want the bolts tested. I don't want those bolts tested at Friday at 4.30 where they're like, ah, oh, it's probably good enough. No. I want that bolt tested, retested, checked, and rechecked. We, none of us like the test, but we all love tested things. I want the pilot tested. I don't want the pilot having gone to DeVry or some online school. I want you tested and retested and retested. This is why I don't fly spirit, because they've given out learner's permits to those. <laughs> I got to stop saying that. My wife is always cringing when I say this, stuff like that. No shade. I do fly spirit sometimes, too. But <laughs> I want you safe. That's what it is. I want you safe. <laughs> Beloved, I hope that you would prosper. Um, and here's, here's why we want things tested. Instinctively and intuitively, we know that if something is going to carry heavy weight, it must have gone through a series of tests. We sing songs on Sundays. Lord, use me. For your glory, I will do anything. Really? <laughs> we want God to use us. We want God to grow us. Lord, I want to be close to you. Okay. In order for God to use you, he has to first test you. In that same logic, we all love 
tested things, but we don't like to be tested. And here's what P- Peter is saying. So that, verse, four, uh, verse 7 and 1-7, here's why you're going through this. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by the fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, Peter is saying something that is really important to God that might not be that important to you right now. You know, as I think back to my my last 10 days, to be perfectly honest, there's times when I, I don't want to be more purified. I'm like, God, you can keep that. I'm, I'll stay with the level of maturity I'm at right now. I don't want to go to this. I don't want that. If the path to get to that is pain, I would rather avoid it. But God, because he loves us, because he loves us, and because the Lord wants you to be a person that is tested, that can carry some heavy weight, that can actually do some kingdom work, something that matters, something that lasts, God allows us to go through the test of fires. Now, here's why this is so important for us to get. In order for you to have endurance in life, and endurance is the ability to withstand a difficult situation for a long period of time, in order for you to have endurance, you either, one, need to know when the thing is going to end, and most of us don't have that luxury, or two, we need to know that it's not meaningless. Something is coming on the other side. Now, I know this only secondhand from having witnessed my my wife go through the misery of childbirth. What carried her through is knowing that there was a baby that was coming. If all she had was pain, it would have been impossible to endure. But any woman in here who's given birth, you know that the pain is only possible to endure because there's a baby coming on the other side. And what Peter is trying to let us know is this, brother or sister, it is not meaningless. It's a lie from the pit of hell that it's meaningless or that you're alone or there's no purpose. Somehow, God is working this to refine you. So he calls us to endure. So number two, second implication from this text is when we don't get what we want, we can choose who we want to be. This is Christianity 301. This is not one-on-one stuff. When you don't get what you want, When you don't get the outcome that you wanted, when you don't get the version of life that you wanted, when it's permanent, not when it still might happen, in that moment, you have a decision to make. You can choose who you want to be. Fires do not always refine. Sometimes fires destroy. You know, over the past decade, one of the things that has caused people to walk away from faith more than anything is unanswered prayers. They believed that God was going to do X, Y, and Z, and God let ABC happen. And when God let ABC happen, they walked away in faith. There was refinement that was happening in their life that could have happened in their life. Here's what I want you to do. In the moments where you don't get what you want, You can still choose who you want to be. And the who you want to be is on the other side of having endured patiently through difficulty with hardship as every giant in the faith has ever done in the past, holding on to God's hand and trusting him through it. Uh, I was having lunch with a member from Renaissance a couple weeks ago, and he said something that was profound that stuck with me. He said, in life, we have to choose from the options we have, not the options we wish we had. You know, in the last couple of weeks, I've been thinking about my life, all the options I wished I had, and I don't have those options. And it would do us a lot of justice if we didn't spend time wondering what we wished we had, but rather from the options that we do presently have. Am I going to be the person that holds on to God's hand through this, trusting that he is going to do something in and through me in this process? And so Peter is inviting us to choose who we want to be to respond with faith. Now, a goldsmith, when he or she is trying gold, when they are testing gold, what they are doing is they are turning up the heat to burn away the impurities that they see visibly in the gold. And a master goldsmith knows exactly how hot to turn it. And here's what Peter is saying. It's hot, but it's not unnecessarily hot. And God is doing something in this. And so Peter wants to let us know 
that God is trying to birth things in and through us. Now, one of the things that is most difficult, admittedly, is when we experience difficulty, most of us, the first question we go to is why? Why did this thing happen? And a number of weeks ago, we talked a whole sermon on this one very question. And when I've gone through the worst moments of my life, I've asked that question over and over again. Why, God? Why would you let this happen? Why would you let my nightmare unfold? Why would you do this to me? I thought I was faithful to you. Is this how you repay me? What's your answer? Please tell me, what are you doing? And God has never given me an answer to the why questions in my life. I think for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, there, when you go through something painful enough, the answer to why it happened will not satisfy you anyway. Why did your parents abandon you? Is an answer going to make you, your childhood better? No. It's still going to be something that's difficult for you to process. When you think about the pain in life, that's not the answer that Scripture wants to answer. That's not the question that Scripture wants to answer. Scripture wants us to ask different questions. And the question on our table right now for us today is this. What is the result of this suffering going to be in my life? This, again, this is Christianity 301, 401. This is graduate-level Christianity material to wrestle through. When you find yourself in painful situations, it's natural to ask the question, why? But to instead ask the question, Lord, what is the result of this suffering in my life? And so I think, to be perfectly honest, the result is that in difficulty, God does stuff inside of us that would have never happened in daytime. God does stuff in the night that we would never be able to endure, see in the daytime. I'm doing this thing called Lectio 365. It's like this way to read scripture where you go through. It's an ancient way of reading through the Bible. And I was doing a, an exercise this week, and the woman who was doing the devotional that day said a thought that really stuck with me. She said, during the daytime, we can see no farther than what's called the common line, and that is about 62 miles away. So in sunny, in sunny conditions, if you look outside where there's nothing obstructing you, no clouds, you can see 62 miles away. However, at nighttime, in perfect darkness, we can see all the way to Andromeda, a collection of one trillion stars, 2.5 million light years away. Sometimes we need the night seasons to dial down the distraction of the day, and we will be able to see what is much in front of us, what lies much beyond. There are things in your, night, in your life right now that you wish to God you can change. They turn down the light, and those things will allow you to see what lies right in front of you. You know, one of the things I've learned also in Scripture is that Jesus himself, in Hebrews 5 and 7, it says, Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. And that's such a profound concept that would take a whole sermon in and of itself to break down. But there's so much about what it means to follow Jesus that you learn. Like, not a lesson that, oh, that's, oh that was a cool point. But you truly learn these things through our suffering. There's so much that we learn about God in difficult seasons that we would have never known about him in daytime. You know, one of the things that I regret from growing up is that I didn't take church seriously when I was a kid. And there was so much richness in the tradition that I grew up in, in the old black church. And there was so much that I just discarded or didn't pay attention to that I wish I could go back to and say, Jordan, pay attention to what is being said right now. This is, these, are, these are bombs. These are jewels that people are dropping. Every now and then, someone would get up and testify about the goodness of God. It would be a church mother that has walked with God for 80 years. And she never went to seminary, but when she said that God was a provider, she wasn't speaking about some magazine article that she read one day. She was speaking from the perspective of someone who had walked with God through night seasons and had seen God provide. God make a way when there was no way. And to hear her testimony, it has come not through seasons of daytime, but through night seasons. And they would always say things like this, you... You can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. They've seen too much. They've seen his provision. They've seen the way he has come through for them. And you can't make, you can't make them doubt him. Please. 
one of the things that I, I wish I can go back and just sit at those mother's feet and ask them to share their testimony and to share the stories of how God has walked with them. And what you will find, if you were blessed to hear these stories over the years, is that the people who have the greatest conviction about the power of God are people who have seen God flex his power in their absolute weakness. And God wants us to experience that. God loves you too much to let you drown in daytime. Last implication for us is that during the difficult seasons of life, we are called to faithfully commit to a faithful God. During the difficult seasons of life, you are called to faithfully commit to a faithful God. Now, Peter calls God faithful, and again, he's calling God faithful not because of what is happening to this crowd of people right in front of them. Their worst nightmare is happening in front of them, so clearly it can't be their circumstances that is causing him to say that he's faithful. So why would Peter call God faithful? And it's because of the cross. It is not because of their circumstances, but because of the cross that Peter would have the audacity to say that God is faithful. It is the cross that shows us that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for the ungodly. It is the cross that shows us that there is nothing in all of creation that will keep God's love separated from us. And if Jesus would endure the cross, then he'll if the cross did not make him walk away from us, nothing will. And in looking at the cross this past week, I've been wrestling with God, saying, God, I, I don't know what you're doing sometimes. It just doesn't make sense. But when I look to the cross, when I get a glimpse of it, I get a little bit of assurance and a little bit of certainty that there's nothing he wouldn't do for me so what he's allowing to happen in my life must be for his glory and for my good. And Peter says to just continue to do good. So in verse 19, 4, 1 Peter 4, 19, he says, So then, those who suffer according to God's will, this is what you should do. You should commit yourselves to the faithful creator and continue to do good. This morning I was wrestling like, Lord, what does it mean to continue to do good? And I think the Lord met me by answering what would you do if I answered all of your prayers? Like everything was a yes, down to like yes, 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 yes. Everything, you were just in the sweetest season of your life. What would you do then? Would you serve then? Would you come to the 9 a.m. next week then? <laughs> would you be kind then? Would you lift your hands and praise God then? Of course you would. So continue to do good. God is not calling you to go overseas and be a missionary for most of us. He's calling us to just continue to do the good things that are right in front of us, to be a servant, to be in community, to worship him, to fight with every fiber in our body, to hold on to his unchanging hand. And so when we are going through difficult times, one, first and foremost, Sometimes we need other people around us who we can borrow their strength because in the moment it feels like it's too hard to hold on. But scripture is calling us to just continue to put one foot in front of the other, looking at the cross, trusting him, and saying, asking God just for enough strength just for that day. Uh, there's a story by a woman named Elizabeth Elliot, and she talked about shepherds um, in Great Britain and how they would often take rams and sheep one by one, and they would throw them, thrust them into this dipping trough, this huge vat filled with antiseptic liquid. The shepherd had to completely submerge each animal, holding its ears and eyes and nose all the way under the surface. She talked about what, watching these shepherds do this and how horribly frightening it was for each sheep. And if one of these sheep tried to climb out, the sheepdogs would bark and scare it back into the trough. But as terrifying of an experience as it was for the sheep, without this periodic treatment, they would become victims of parasites and disease. It was for their good. Even though it didn't feel like it was for their good, it was for their good. Jesus is our good shepherd. Sometimes our good shepherd submerges us 
under the waters of difficulty, and it feels like he might be trying to kill you, but he's not. It's for our good. And so this is the reality that we will have to accept by faith, that one day we will look back that we have experienced the goodness of what holding on will do. And so we're going to pray for you in just a moment that we would have just enough strength to hold on to God's unchanging hand and that by faith we would hold on. In the difficulty, we would hold on. In the burning, we would hold on, trusting that he is doing something. And my hope and my prayer is that one day when we tell testimonies at Renaissance, yours will be in that number. We'll hear about the goodness of God in your life because you held on. We'll hear about how God has refined you in your holding on. And so let me pray for us now. Jesus, you know the stories of my brothers and my sisters. You know the pain. You know the questions. You know how long these situations have been going on in some of their lives. Jesus, first and foremost, you weep with them. And secondly, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would give us the strength to hold on to you so that in our time of testing, we would not burn away, but we would be refined. Jesus, surround my brothers and sisters with the right people to speak life into their life, to meet them exactly where they are. Holy Spirit, would you seal your word on our hearts and speak to us about your goodness that we would have the strength to hold on another day through the refining. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.